Everyone loves a good double cross. It's why every daytime talk show and soap opera has been on the air longer than many of us have been alive. But as the old saying goes, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. And even the most carefully planned double crosses can blow up in your face. So, today we're looking at historical backstabs that backfired big time. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other infamous deceptions you would like to hear about next. Okay, you better watch your back. Attila the Hun swept through Western Europe in the 5th century BCE, ransacking what is now France. But the incursion was halted by a coalition led by the Roman general Flavius Aetius at the Battle of the Catalonian Fields. We imagine Flavius hoped to get a commendation or something, but instead his stellar service was rewarded by getting whacked at the hand of Emperor Valentinian III, believing Aetius intended to place his own son on the throne. Instead of Valentinian's firstborn, the emperor accused the general of trumped-up charges of drunkenness and insubordination, and then took care of him. According to one source, after Valentinian finished the act, a courtier said, You have just cut off your right hand with your left, like an Evil Dead situation. The ominous prediction by the surprisingly eloquent advisor held true. Less than six months later, two of Aetius' subordinates got their revenge on Valentinian, slaying the emperor in the middle of the city, in broad daylight, with none of the nearby guards even trying to stop it. Not content with unifying Japan under his banner, Toyotome Hideyoshi launched an audacious bid to become Emperor of China, beginning with the conquest of Korea in 1592. Jeez, dude, leave some of the continent for the rest of us. The incursion stalled when one outstanding Korean admiral, named Yi Sun-shin, inflicted a series of catastrophic defeats upon the Japanese fleet. But with great acclaim comes great jealousy, and Yi's position was coveted by fellow officer Wong Yun. So much so that he plotted and schemed to remove Yi from power. When Yi was in prison for disobeying orders that would have sent his fleet into a trap, Wang Yun was handed the reins. What a win, right? Well, in his one and only naval battle as commander, he indeed sent his fleet into a trap. Wang Yun was declared KIA and lost all but 12 of the Korean Navy's warships. Meanwhile, Yi's allies in court managed to convince the king of his innocence which must have really pissed off Wang Yun's ghost. When you think of the Renaissance, you may think of the Italian city of Florence and its powerful Medici family. The Medicis made their fortune in banking and spent lavishly to support Florence's burgeoning arts movement. But with this wealth and acclaim came jealousy and a plot by the rival Pazzi family to knock the Medicis from their perch. The plan was simple, assassinate the current ruler Lorenzo and his younger brother, Guiliano. They wanted to finish off the siblings outside the city walls at the same time, but the brothers kept separating when the attacks were supposed to go down. After months of waiting, the plotters decided at the last moment to attack the Medicis during mass. Guiliano was stabbed 19 times, with Francesco Pazzi making the fatal blow. Lorenzo managed to escape the sacrilegious ambush with a minor neck wound. During the attack, Jacopo Pazzi was supposed to rouse the city's population against the Medicis, but soon found the Pazzi family badly underestimated the level of public support for the Medicis, and how willing everyone would be to forgive a violent attack in church. Turns out people don't like that so much. Francesco was dragged from his bed and hung by an angry mob, alongside several other conspirators. Jacopo tried to flee the city, but was soon captured and dispatched alongside scores of his family. But apparently, death alone was not sufficient punishment for Jacopo. His body was exhumed from the Pazzi family tomb and reburied outside the city walls. Then some local children dug up the remains and dragged Jacopo back through the city before chucking him into the river Arno. When asked why, the children allegedly said, I don't know what to tell you, bud. In 1592 CE, the fearsome warlord Oda Nobunaga was on the cusp of unifying Japan under his banner. With news of a siege stalling in the west, he ordered one of his top generals, Akechi Mitsuhide, to gather his men. But he probably should have picked someone else. With Nobunaga staying the night in the Honoji Temple in Kyoto, 
Mitsuhide turned on his master and overwhelmed the few retainers Nobunaga had on hand. With the situation lost, Nobunaga set fire to the tempo and took his own life. That's some um, I'm taking my ball and going home energy. It seemed like Akechi Mitsuhide was poised to finish what his master had started and ultimately become the ruler of Japan, but he only had a week to enjoy his spoils. After that, the forces of another Nobunaga subordinate defeated Mitsuhide's troops. Mitsuhide fled the scene, but he was slain by a bandit leader less than a month later. Easy come, easy go. Li Bu was one of several warlords vying for control of China in the wake of the Han Dynasty's collapse. He cut his teeth as an officer in service of a magistrate named Ding Yuan, and even became his adopted son. A strange move, but an undeniably effective career strategy. However, when powerful warlord Dong Zhuo came onto the scene, Li Bu jumped at the chance to betray his adopted father in exchange for a place at Dong Zhuo's side. He lopped off poor Ding Yuan's head and became the foster son of Dong Zhuo. Li Bu served his new master well, until he also betrayed and killed him. People should probably stop adopting this guy. Li Bu spent the next few years moving from one warlord to another, until he was apprehended in his sleep and presented to the great warlord Chao Chao. Li Bu offered to serve Chao Chao, but this was rebuffed on the advice of warlord Liu Bei, whom Li Bu had the unfortunate habit of calling Big Ears. Li Bu was strangled on the orders of Chao Chao, and we'd like to imagine the strangler said, Big Ears sent me. Of course, much of his story comes from the 14th century novel The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is a dramatized version of history, like Braveheart, so take it with a hefty pinch of salt. The eldest son of Alexander the Great's bodyguard, Ptolemaeus Garavnos, was passed over for the Egyptian throne in favor of his younger brother, Philavelphos, who ruled as Ptolemy II. After he was disinherited, Garavnos linked up with another of Alexander's successors, Selefkos, to topple yet another Alexandrian alum, Lysimachos, and claim his kingdom. But once Lysimachos was vanquished, the impetuous Garavnos knifed Selefkos in the back and claimed Lysimachos' kingdom as his own. Following all that so far, there are a lot of Os names in there. Treachery may have won Karavnos a crown, but it did not make him super popular. He managed to fend off the initial challenges to his throne, but the chaos prompted an army of Galatians to swoop in. Karavnos refused to lend aid to the neighboring tribes and, in doing so, he signed his own death certificate. His would-be allies became enemies and joined up with the Galatian king Voios. Karavnos was defeated in battle, and the victorious Celts mounted his head on a spear. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Artavanos was the captain of the Persian king Xerxes' personal guard. It's nice work, if you can get it. But after his disastrous attempts to invade Greece, and an expensive building program that depleted the empire's treasury, the knives were out for Xerxes. So, Artavanos went in on a conspiracy with Xerxes' son-in-law, Megavizos, who sounds like he may have been a Decepticon, and a conniving court advisor named Aspamitres, who sounds like an artificial sweetener. The plan was simple, kill Xerxes, and pin the blame on the eldest son, Darius. The scheme was carried out flawlessly, and the unfortunate Darius was executed by his younger brother, Artaxerxes, for his crime, despite his vigorous denials. Not content with just one regicide, the gang got back together to take out the new king. But Artavanos soon discovered that vows don't mean an awful lot among backstabbers. Megavizos sold out both Artavanos and Asparmitres to gain favor with Artaxerxes, and Artavanos was swiftly whacked. Ottoman Sultan Osman II was nicknamed The Young. So, you know his story doesn't end well. The 13-year-old sultan ascended to the throne at the expense of his uncle Mustafa, who was declared mentally unsound for political reasons, and confined to a room in his palace. Meanwhile, Osman wasn't terribly impressed with the performance of the Janissaries, the elite personal guard of the sultan, and decided to replace them with an entirely new army raised from peasants. He also wanted to move the capital of Constantinople to Damascus. But once they got wind of the scheme, 
The Janissaries, led by Pasha, moved swiftly to topple the teenager. Osman was seized and dragged through the city like a common thief, and the hostile crowd had little sympathy for their ruler's plight. Mustafa was restored to the throne, and Pasha was rewarded with the plump position of Grand Vizier in the new regime. Pasha ordered Osman's execution, but was a little too zesty in doing so, because he did it without Mustafa's approval. He was promptly arrested and given a taste of his own medicine. Pasha's time at the top, and his life, was over in a matter of weeks. Marcus Junius Brutus might be the most famous backstabber outside of Fredo Corleone. He played a key role in one of the best-known conspiracies in recorded history, the assassination of Julius Caesar in March 44 BCE. He was also a fantastic juggler, but nobody ever mentions that. A coalition of conspirators was formed to stop Caesar from destroying the Roman Republic. While some may have been motivated more by personal ambition than lofty ideals, the group that struck down Caesar viewed themselves as liberators. Or at least that's what they said. Caesar was ultimately stabbed 23 times. Though who struck the killing blow, and whether or not Caesar's last words were quite as dramatic as Shakespeare would have you believe, is not known. However, Brutus made the mistake of leaving Caesar's right-hand man, Mark Antony, alive, and the conspirators misread how stoked the public would be about Caesar's demise. The Senate House was burned down, and the liberators were forced to flee the city. Brutus and Cassius raised an army in Greece, but were defeated by the combined forces of Mark Antony and Octavian, Caesar's nephew and named heir. And the most unkindest cut of all, the very thing the conspirators wanted to save, the Roman Republic, was finished off by Octavian, who took the name Augustus after he prevailed in a power struggle with Mark Antony. A too cruel irony? So what do you think? Which of these betrayals was the worst? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.